y'all welcome back to the channel if you are new here welcome my name is Kaya and today we are going to be listening to Metallica's fifth album the black album <laughs> uh, is it black I don't know black is it called black black album uh, I just know it as the black album so uh, very excited for this one I have heard a lot of y'all wanting this record as well as some of their previous albums um, but I uh, was going to just do a uh, listening of Enter Sandman and then figured you know what might as well just do the entire record I haven't really dived too much into like a full album from Metallica so I'm definitely interested to hear what this one sounds like um, so if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please feel free to do so. I post weekly videos documenting my entire metal journey as I am a new baby metal head. So I've only been listening to metal since uh, February of 2022. So definitely just diving into a ton of different artists. If that sounds interesting to you, then join subscribe um, we also have a discord it is called the mosh pit there's an invite link down below in the description you can join our community and I also have a PO box if you want to send something to be featured in one of my metal unboxing videos it's also in the description below like and share the video with a friend and let me know your thoughts on the black album let's get into the video Okay, right off the bat, I have heard this song. It does sound familiar. this song okay um so I never realized that it was Metallica I don't know I don't know why I thought it was Nirvana baby metalhead again baby metalhead don't be too hard on me okay really really great catchy riff I know I'm laughing a little because I know that some of y'all were a little salty that I roasted Metallica so hard in the top 30 ranking video that I did um, but that was all before we started kind of like diving more into their discography um, with Master of Puppets and One. I definitely think One is my favorite over Master of Puppets and I, I do want something of Metallica's to like grab me. I always want every band to grab me somehow so this song is beefy i like it so far and i like the chorus it's the same riff but it's almost like 
mm, little half time and a little it feels just a little slowed down in a way and I like it it's a little switch very minor but you can tell I like it kid comforting a kid I really like it uh, the guitar solo meaty fat this is this is a bop this is a bop and a half definitely I think this is the strongest like song so far that I've heard out of everything from Metallica it kind of reminds me of like some Pantera uh, just like a little bit of Nirvana I don't know it's the 90s okay it's the 90s so people were People were releasing some really good music during this time, and I really, really like this song. You heard, it's just the beasts under your bed, in your closet, in your head. that was juicy and I loved the outro that they had because they could have just like 
ended at a never never land which they did layer with like his normal vocal track and then a whisper they layered like a whisper sort of thing on it which, which was delicious but they could have ended it right there and i love that they stretched it out and just did this outro piece with all of these different like vocals all these layered vocals with different um effects on them and then they had this like acoustic guitar that was kind of like layered over it which i thought was really cool playing in florida december 16th they're playing in LA. That riff, man. Enter Sandman. There it is. I already really, really like that song. So much better than any of the other singles we've listened to so far. lead single okay so it's a self-titled album okay so it's just titled metallica it's just self-titled okay everybody just calls it the black album then the lead single from metallica's commercially successful self-titled album enter sandman was certified platinum selling over 1 million copies the song was metallica's biggest radio hit and it's considered their signature song yeah it's definitely a banger it's a bop the song follows the theme of childhood fear in nightmares with the ep eponymous Sandman symbolizing the sleep that he dreads. However, the Sandman of European folklore actually represents the bringer of good dreams. In 2007, drummer Lars Ulrich told Uncut Magazine, I'm assuming, Enter Sandman was the first thing we came up with when we sat down for the songwriting process in July 1990. That's the first song oh my god 10 minute 12 tempo changes side of metallica had run its course we wanted to streamline and simplify things we wrote the song in a day or two of course you did nice all the bits of enter sandman are derived from the main riff yep that's how you know a song is really freaking good i feel like some of the best i don't care about your full clothes ads there you go oh genius I feel like all of like the best songs ever recorded, most of them took like that much time. Sometimes they take like just a, like five minutes to write, or they might take like a day or two to like fully just track and like shovel out, but that's so cool. I can't believe that's the first song. <laughs> Man, what a productive session. You're like, all right, great, what's next? <laughs> Try to top that up. Try to top that song after uh, after you record it. Meanwhile, James Hetfield told Uncut, I wanted more of the mental thing where this kid gets manipulated by what adults say. When you know when you wake up with that stuff in your eye, that's supposedly been put in there by the Sandman to make your dream, to make you dream. So the guy in the song tells this little kid that and he kind of freaks. He can't sleep after that and it works the opposite way. Instead of a soothing thing, the table's turned. 20 years after the song's release, producer Bob Rock shared the original concept of the song's lyrics with Music Radar. At first, based on the music and the riff, the band and their management thought it could be the first single. Then they heard James's lyrics and realized the song was about crib death. Good lord. That didn't go over well. I wonder why. <laughs> I sat down with James and talked to him about his words. I told him, what you have is great, but it can be better. Does it have to be so literal? Not that I was thinking about the single. I just wanted him to make the song great. It was a process. Him learning to say what he wanted, but in a more poetic and open sort of way. He we wrote some lyrics and it was all there. The first single. Yeah. Definitely have to be a little more easy on the listeners if you're gonna have a radio single but that's really cool i was looking at um let's see i think google said that this was this one like a grammy which is really cool um definitely one of their more like critically acclaimed albums of their whole career um very interesting self-titled what is this 
Exit light, enter night, take my hand, we're off to never, never land. As promised by his father, the Sandman has arrived to take the child to the land of dreams. Neverland is the fictional home of Peter Pan that symbolizes innocence, untouched childhood, and immortality. At face value, these lyrics are innocuous. However, the way Hetfield sings them has a darker tone. This could mean that even though the Sandman is generally known to bring sleep and dreams, there is a source of evil coming from the Sandman or the child, as the home of Peter Pan is Neverland. Never Neverland could mean the nightmare version of Neverland. Never Never may also reference a place where people die in the poem Where Dead Men Lie by Barcroft Bokes. This is alluded to in the first stanza. Out on the waste of the Never Never, that's where the dead men, dead men lie. There, where the heat waves dance forever, that's where the dead men lie. Interesting. Something's wrong, shut the light, heavy thoughts tonight. And they aren't of snow white. Dreams of war, dreams of liars, dreams of dragons, fire, and of things that will bite. Ooh, I like that. It's very poetic, and I think that the, the whole concept is very interesting and I love that we were able to like read stuff about like the production process. I think it's really cool that they recorded and basically completed this whole song in like two days, had the whole thing mapped out at least. So that's definitely, uh, it definitely shows that this song is like very, very special. <laughs> the next song we're going to listen to is called Sad But True. Curious to see how they follow this up. impressions the riff sick nasty just like inter sandman just super punchy super gritty got the sass got the grit love it um sorry i'm trying to get comfortable i'm i'm getting i'm getting comfortable okay for the record um and i also like that they're holding out the last like note of this riff i like that because they could easily just like keep going but they hold it out liked the pause too extra long pause um and i have to say the drums sound really nice in this mix i am listening to the remastered version because i'm a princess okay and i want to but that aside oh i love when drums are nice and forward and balanced in a good mix and it's balanced and it sounds dank hey, hey. Pain while you repay You know it's sad but true 
over the chorus. Uh, the chorus sounds very off. Like it's meant to sound off and unsettling almost, especially because they have these like layered guitars here that are kind of playing this sort of like unsettling, ominous tone throughout it. A lot of layered vocals. Um, I really like the drum hits too. It's so forward in the mix, which I love, but it's like following his enunciation of like words, which is really nice. Um, it's not my favorite though. It's not really hitting. I feel like the chorus just isn't sitting right with me, but the verses, oh, I like the verses and I like that there's like sort of this like reverbed echo of some of the words accents for some of the the ending lyrics of the verse words sad but true jumping into that little riff he holds the notes and then now we're going into kind of like a I guess like a third verse type of deal the solos simple but delicious it's the tone of his guitar and the delivery of it that's very simple it's a very like I don't know it's like commercial sounding but it's like ugh. it's got the grit that I I want and I need in a guitar solo and I also again love the drums in this this chorus they amplified it more with like more uh, background sounds <laughs> and more uh, vocals layered vocals and I love how the echo he would say a word and then it would get panned the echo would get panned here say a word echo gets panned here say a word it gets kind of panned more forward here and then we go into the solo really nice way to build the chorus up more right before you take it all away and then give the solo so that was a really really nice way to build the track hey, when you want love, pay, pay the price pay for nothing's fair
in the end there too. Sad but true. I could see me singing that song. I could see it. I mean, it's catchy. I'm not a huge fan of the chorus right now, but I could see it growing on me. Also, if you hear snoring, it's Spooner. I'm sorry. He's a bloodhound. I can't help it, okay? He's got the nose that's a mile long, all right? Uh, the fifth and final single released from Metallica's seminal self-titled album. Wow, so they did five singles to promote this record. Dang, girl. Sad But True is about a person's darker side taking control. Influenced by the 1978 horror film Magic. Haven't seen that one. Starring Anthony Hopkins. Good actor. This song is a monologue justifying the existence of this darker side, which in the film is symbolized by a foul-mouthed ventriloquist dummy. Interesting. Um, the song has been interpreted as an allusion to addiction, a struggle Hetfield has been open about having previously entered rehab for alcohol and other addictions. Another being chocolate. Oh, God. The song was later sampled by Kid Rock, of course, on American Badass. Uh, artists, one of the artists said about the song, it was an example of the record's natural evolution. Rock had first described Sad But True as a cashmere for the 90s. Oh, interesting. Yet it would be the grandeur of Nothing Else Matters and the Un Unforgiven that filled that role. In dispelling the public's preconceptions of what Metallica might achieve, they had dispelled their own as well. Interesting. You know, I don't mind it. I don't mind it. I prefer the verses, not so much the chorus, but the chorus I could act is that, like stuck in my head now. I'm your dream, make you real. I'm your eyes when you must steal. I'm your pain when you can't feel. Sad but true. Sad but true. Definitely super catchy. In the chorus and later in the bridge, three of the listeners' senses are discussed by their dark side. Imagination or dreaming, sight, and touch slash emotion. The dark side states that regardless of what the listener wants to believe, he exists and is their essence. This is stated as fact and the listener's opinion of it is not important no matter how sickening this dark side is. Hmm. I'm your life, I'm the one who takes you there. I'm your life, I'm the one who cares. Hetfield's inner voice starts the song by demanding his attention. Initially, the voice declares his existence. The song later becomes a manifesto, justifying the inner voice slash dark side's importance. The story of addiction has shown that addicts respond to the prescriptions of a destructive thought process known as the critical inner voice. In this song, the voice is non-specific, but could easily describe addiction. It's ambiguity however is powerful and could also describe other types of desire and drive including the quest for power interesting this isn't their first song on addiction because i think master of puppets was also about it right i'm pretty sure the next song we are going to listen to is the third track holier than thou
first impressions, I'm like focusing on the lyrics. <laughs> I liked his pronunciation in the chorus. Holier than thou are. I don't know. Thou. Something like that. And then I like how he's like, you are. So it then introduces the you are. Holier than thou. Something like that. Really nice. This whole album so far, and I'm hoping they stay with this theme. Although I hope they also give me one really good ballad. I like the vibe of this. Like, I actually really like the drive. It's very riff heavy, just good, catchy riffs. It's a banger. I mean, they're just nice. It, it's good summertime driving music. It's kind of giving me like some Megadeth, Iron Maiden kind of vibes. Like, it just, it feels like really good thrash, just, you know. I like it. I like it. I can, I can snap my fingers to it. Um, the riffs are catchy. And I really liked the beginning of this too. They kind of had this like super, it was kind of buried honestly. I wish they had brought it up a little bit more in the mix. But it was almost like a, it was like a wah pedal type sound or some sort of like interesting guitar sound. That almost sounded like wow, wow, type of thing, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a guitar. Um, and it was kind of like just sitting there in the pocket introducing you to it. I like it, it's punchy. guitar solo following it kind of he like solos and then I think he paused and then like followed the drums to whenever the drums would pause he would kind of hold out a note and then do something hold out the note follow the drums oh and then they give the bass I'm a sucker for like a good bass solo they gave him a good bass solo and the layers Oh, ba na 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 da na 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 da na 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 and then they kind of panned it sort of like they had another what fourth layer of that riff so you have all of these oh it was like nice and big you know not something like that I like it it's fire <laughs> it's a banger y'all this album is actually grabbing my attention it is, it is, 
It's just the riffs. The guitar solo sound really good. It's got some sass to it. I win it all. Love falls down. I'm telling you all along. Sorry, Kanye song. I ain't even gonna act holier than thou. <laughs> Although described by James Hetfield as one of the sillier songs by the band, really, Holier Than Thou deals with the issue of a self-righteous person paraphrasing Jesus in the book of Matthew. Interesting. Judge not that ye be not judged. Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the moat out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Matthew 7, 1 through 4, 5. Fun fact, Bob Rock initially suggested that this song should be the first single from Metallica. That's probably about all you need to know about him. Get wrecked. What? What's our, what's our consensus on Bob Rock? If you're like a diehard Metallica fan, what's what's the what's the tea? The band still teases me about the song because it was the first track that jumped out at me as a potential single. I should point out at this stage in cutting the record there were no lyrics, so initially something about the song spoke to me. I could see that. It rocked in a very aggressive way that said Metallica to me. As we got deeper into the record, the tide turned and other songs blossomed and became bigger and turned into things like Enter Sandman, whereas Holier Than Thou Great song, not a single. I still like its energy and tempo. It's got such a lethal bite to it. Every time I see the band, they always say the same thing. Holier than thou, huh? They'll never let me live it down. What can I say? Oh, I love it. I love the whole recording process. It's just like, it's honestly one of the biggest things like that I love about music is just being able to be in a studio and record. But like a real studio. Nowadays, you can just record anything at home, which is great. Um, but like to be in a real professional studio, the full nine, have an actual audio engineer, have the whole soundboard, be in a booth to record your vocals, like doing the whole thing. I've done it multiple times, not to toot my own horn, but the whole experience is just fantastic. It's so cool. Highly recommend if you are thinking about recording a record. It's worth the money, but you can also make really good music in your own home studio nowadays. Judge not that ye be not judged. No more. The crap rolls out of your mouth again. Haven't changed. Your brain is still gelatin. Oh, bars. Little whispers circle around your head. Why don't you worry about yourself instead? Who are you? Where you been? Where you're from? Gossip burning on the tip of your tongue. Or like that. Gossip, or uh, you lie so much you believe yourself. Judge not lest ye be judged yourself. Holier than thou you are. This is not approved, but it says he thinks that self-righteousness makes him a better person. In other words, I've lived in fifth. I've lived in sin, filth, I've, I've lived in filth, I've lived in sin, and I still smell cleaner than the shit here is. How have I not heard that? That is a bar and a half. Oh, Bubba, I like that. I need me some cup towels with that on there. I lived in filth, I lived in sin, and I still smell cleaner than the shit you're in. <laughs> I love it, Bubba. Oh man, before you judge me, take a look at you. Can't you find something better to do? James points out the hypocrisy of this self-righteousness. The one judging is going against what he lives by, which is supposedly higher morals. So take a look at you, never practicing what you preach. Interesting. I'm, I'm here for this whole album so far. Definitely. So... We're going into the fourth track, which is called The Unforgiven. Oh, I like this. 
this already. instrumentally that's happening sorry I'm like my ears are like <laughs> oh my lordies uh okay so first thing oh the instrumental kind of medieval delicious if you've been watching me for a while acoustic guitar is the way to my heart and it's beautiful kind of medieval makes me want to play Skyrim I love it I love it so much. Mm. Uh, I also think they have strings kind of layered in here. They're a little buried in the mix. I ain't gonna lie. I wish they were up a little bit more. I also love strings. And there's a tambo. There's a tambourine in this second verse and it's so beautiful. It's got the perfect amount of reverb, but again, it's a little buried in the mix. I want to hear more. This is kind of like a nice little banger and it's really nice how they brought back this sort of like medieval guitar riff that they have for the second verse. Cause it was like a way I'm guessing for that was either the verse that we just passed through or that was the chorus. And now we're going through this other section with that medieval riff there. Money. I'm liking this song a lot so far. Never shine doing what I showed. Never free. So I dug the
song. The song. Oh, I'm emotionally feeling like I'm going to cry because this riff is so beautiful. And this verse, what a na 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 na. Oh, it's like sad, but and like mourning, but like, oh, oh, I'm in my feels and that guitar solo, okay? Oh, she started off just a little soft, you know, a little soft. And then she she built it and then they oh, gave it the grit that we all wanted and we all needed. Okay, just gotta center myself. I felt some tears coming. Okay, I felt some tears. I ain't gonna lie. I think this might be one of my favorite Metallica songs. She's coming for Enter the Sandman. <laughs> I'm Enter the Sandman. I'm just telling you right now, this is absolutely such a beautiful song. I had no idea that Metallica, like, this is the first time I've listened to, like, a full Metallica record, and I'm like, girl, this is good. <laughs> So I don't need to give up Oh! So we just fade then and it leaves like them to just jam it out. Oh. Sorry my freaking SD card got full. I had to swap it. The Unforgiven Metallica. Okay, so this seems to be a really popular song. I'm assuming this is another single. It's a metal ballad co-written by Ulrich, Hammett, and Hetfield. This song is about the struggles he had with religion related to his mom's death. His relatives did not want to give James' his mom the treatment she needed because they thought God would help her through it. He starts to question the legitimacy of religion. The horn sound intro was taken from the movie score of the appropriately titled The Unforgiven and reversed for legal reasons. Mass, my man. <laughs> Hetfield singing was inspired by Chris's Chris Isaacs in Wicked Game. He was used to screaming, not singing. He was used to screaming, not singing. Oh. What have the artists said about the song? Now it's Lars and myself that kind of produced Kirk through the solos because Kirk just needs and needed to be pushed as Hammett struggled for a version of the Unforgiven solo. Lars can be seen cringing on the studio sofa while Rock goads Hammett over his performance. He's got to eat, breathe, live this solo until it's done. What does dub the Unforgiven mean? Well, thee is the pronoun for thou, which is the old archaic term meaning you. Basically, at the end of the chorus, James is telling the person he's singing about, so I dub you unforgiven. Thee is also a play on the song titled The Unforgiven. Oh, this song. In my feels. In my freaking feels. New blood joins this earth and quickly he's subdued. Through constant pain, disgrace, the young boy learns their rules. With time, the child draws in this worship, this whipping boy done wrong, deprived of all his thoughts. The young man struggles on and on, he's known. Ooh, a vow unto his own that never from this day he, his will 
they'll take away. His will they'll take away, yeah. The non-internally young man makes a vow that society, despite fervently trying to subdue and silence the man, will never take away his will and inherent fighting spirit. What I felt, what I've known, never shined through in what I've shown. Ours never be, never see, won't see what might have been. What I felt, what I've known, never shined through in what I've shown, never free, never me, so I dub thee unforgiven. What the young man has felt and known all of his life has never been accurately represented by how he acted due to his fear of the punishments that society would bring to him if he did so. He acts hypocritically on the outside because if he acted in accordance to his true feelings and knowledge, he would get further ridiculed and subdued by the arrogant society. He'll never see what kind of person he would have been since society has taken away his unique personality, feelings, and thoughts. Also, the song ends with a clever wordplay on the song title instead of the name itself, The Unforgiven. Interesting. Oh, Spooner, you're snoring so loud. I'm here for it. That might be one of my favorite Metallica songs. <laughs> I don't know if they released it as a single or not. I'm assuming by like the view count in comparison to Holier Than Thou, um, at least on YouTube, The Unforgiven has like so many more views than Holier Than Thou. Um, so I'm assuming it's definitely more of their more popular songs. A lot of interesting uh, things that we're talking about. I feel like we're talking about a lot of like mental hardships, um, childhood stuff. Um, we mentioned addiction briefly. Um, just a big theme of this entire record definitely is just instrumentally wise, big, big riffs, big, delicious booty riffs. <laughs> so the next song we are going to listen to is the fifth track, Wherever I May Roam. sort of moody vibe but it was a little more uh I don't know it sounded more Indian <laughs> I don't know it just sounded different it might sound weird to you but here's my thought process is in the unforgiven it sounded more medieval and I don't know there's just it just felt very like yeah, medieval and old in that sense. 
whereas this feels a little more deserty and uh, I don't know just I like it and it kind of had like it seemed like it had some sort of like native Indian instrument that kind of opened it up I don't know the two vibes kind of go together really nicely and I like this song again very riff heavy oh it's gritty it's punchy slow build for the verse and then they're like building it up and then it goes into this like punchy sort of drive oh it's nice I also really like how he introduces the verse with this like eh, eh, eh. Slayer did sort of the same thing too of this kind of like eh, spoken word sort of thing and then he repeats the line in his regular singing voice it's just a very interesting way to like introduce it kind of like builds it up a little bit more gives it a little bit more girth uh, a lot of interesting little like layering pieces in terms of the vocals he's accenting certain things in the in the verse that really give it a nice punch which i really like um overall dope nasty track
they just fade it, leaves it open for them to just jam live. I also like that they changed it. Uh, obviously, it's wherever I may roam, and then they went to wherever I may wonder, wherever my, I may wonder, and then they went back to roam. Kind of just like a subtle change. It was the layering with the guitar solo, bestie, okay? And just him riffing it, and then holding out this note while everything cuts back, just so that it, it's almost like all the air is getting sucked out, and then they give you everything, and he comes back in with, like, the full riff, whole band, and then they do it, like, kind of halfway, where everybody, all the, like, other instruments except for like maybe the drums and a little bass i think it was mostly the second guitar like rhythm section that kind of pulls back so it kind of pulls back halfway but you're still in the pocket you know with his solo and then they go back into this like chorus verse section super great way to layer a track so again just super catchy with the riffs um, and a very catchy chorus also. Wherever I may roam. A lot of these songs I could definitely see myself um, just listening to and having stuck in my head a lot. <laughs> so I'm definitely here for it. A song about a drifter who just walks the earth and is perfectly content about being on the road all the time. Oh, I love it. Simple, simple thing. What have the artists said about the song? Then there was the nascent songs themselves. I never heard a demo like this, Rock said, as he sat with Lars and James in one-on-one -on -one for the filming of the classic album program. They were listening to the 8-track version of Wherever I Might Roam that Lars and Jams had cut at Lars' little home studio. In lieu of, an, of any completed lyric, Hetfield was just wailing the melody as a guide. Rock looked mildly perplexed. It was another of the band's unique working practices. Music and lyrics were kept separate until late in the process. Interesting. Hetfield would work out melodies and then write lyrics that fitted the songs. Syllable by syllable, if necessary, he'd yet to write many of the lyrics for the album, which was to prove a boon to rock. Yeah, I like, I'm kind of the same way too. I mean, when I write my songs, like, I just do basic guitar chords because I mostly shine as a vocalist and a songwriter, and I just do basic chords just to kind of like mark the transitions and then have my band kind of take it from there instrumentally. But I also feel like I really shine as a lyricist when a beat or some other, you know, <laughs> instrument is already figured out. And I feel like that's how Ariana Grande does it too. She goes into the studio with these pre-recorded, you know, already beats. And then she goes in there and she's like, yep, yeah, that's how, like, Thank You Next basically was, like, recorded. Uh, it's very interesting. I definitely feel like with the instruments if it's already like if it's already laid out then you can kind of like get the vibe and you're like you can kind of sit on it and be like okay yeah I'm feeling this saucy vibe or this moody vibe so it's really interesting to read all of these like liner notes um, about this whole process it just makes me want to like go and record in the studio <laughs> and I love how simple this song is it's just about this dude that just walks or like goes on on the road and just goes wherever he wants to go and the road becomes my bride oh, see I love this the road becomes my bride I have stripped out of I have stripped of all but pride so in her I do confide and she keeps me satisfied gives me all I need and with dust in throat I crave only knowledge will I save to the game you stay a slave oh, yeah I don't need to like read this I understand. It makes me think of two things. It makes me think of The Stand by Stephen King, which if you read that book, it's pretty good. It's a slow burn though. She's a longy. She's a thicky girl. She's a thicky. But it's making me think of The Stand, specifically that one crazy dude that like was walking in the desert and like went to go to like the devil side in Las Vegas. If you've read the book, you understand. Uh, the blonde kid. I think he was blonde. 
Um, and then it's also making me think of, um, I think it's Under the Bridge by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And the only reason why is because he talks about um, LA as like a person. Like she treats, you know, he's like, she is this to me, you know? If you know the song, you know what I'm talking about. She talks about, he talks about LA as like a she, and I feel like this is kind of reminding me of it. Where he's like, you know, the roads, she's my bride, she keeps me satisfied. It's just an interesting way to kind of compare songwriting. I love when artists do that and they take these inanimate objects and are like, that's she, like she, him affects me in this way. Um, very interesting. So let's go ahead and get into our next track. We are at number six, which is Don't Tread on Me.
loved it. And I love how he, like, kind of goes... It almost is like he's, like, two-stepping up the fretboard and then he holds out this, like, high note. Oh, fire. Also, two things. Reminds me of Pantera. Reminds me of Walk, specifically, of Matt Pantera. Um, not in a bad way. The best of that song. <laughs> and then the other thing, too, is I think it's really cool that their transition from the verse to the chorus to kind of help introduce that new chord that they have in the chorus is they do this nice meaty drum fill and then they do about two measures, two lines. Settle the score, something like that. And then that's when they kind of introduce, they introduce that new chord right before that. That's just nice. It's a nice subtle change but you notice it, and I love his voice on the word score. Just the little tremble he does is like, oh, I love it. tracks we've listened to but I like I do like that the score. I just feel like they have stronger songs on this one um, that we've listened to the unforgiven and enter Sandman being just some examples James Hetfield describes don't tread on me as just one of those don't F with us songs the track makes obvious references to the Gadsden Flag, which features a rattlesnake, also found on this album's cover. Okay, I was going to say, with the slogan, Don't Tread on Me, underneath it. Several lyrics make direct references to a letter Benjamin Franklin wrote to the Pennsylvania Journal in 1775 addressing what would become the Gadsden Flag, like shining with brightness, always on surveillance, eyes that never close, emblem of vigilance. And never begins it, never, but once engaged, never surrenders. It's also worth noting that the guitar lead in the intro is the America melody from West Side Story. It can be heard here. Yeah, I was going to say, the intro riff to this song sounded super familiar. It sounded like it was from like a play or something like that. Uh... In 2012, James Hetfield told Village Voice, I love the song, but it shocked a lot of people because everyone thought it was pro-war when they thought we were anti-war and all we're doing is writing songs. We're not standing politically on any side. Don't Tread on Me was just one of those don't F with us songs and obviously referencing the flag and the snake and what it meant that all tied into the Black Album and the snake icon icon on the album cover and I think it's great to play that song live we're over here in Europe playing it and people aren't appalled by the songs we haven't played it in Iraq or Iran yet though yeah I might just avoid that a little bit but that's up to you Bubba <laughs> also if you like don't offend people with your music is it even metal like come on okay it's not like the whole point <laughs> The inscription on the Gadsden flag whose rattlesnake adorns the cover of the album. Super cool. Liberty or death. What we so proudly hail. 
The first line refers to something Patrick Henry spoke at the Virginia Convention in 1775, give me liberty or give me death. The second line refers to the Star Spangled Banner, what so proudly we hailed. I was going to say, yeah, it sounds like a Star Spangled Banner. Once you provoke her rattling of her tail, yeah. We know rattlesnakes. I think it's interesting. I have a thought. I'm going to read this first, though. In December 1775, an American guesser anonymous, anonymously wrote about the rattlesnake being a symbol of American to the Pennsylvania Journal. She never begins an attack, nor when once engaged, ever surrenders. She is therefore an emblem of magnanimity and true courage. She never wounds till she has generously wounds till she has generously given notice even to her enemy and cautioned him against the danger of treading on her. Many scholars now agree that this American guesser was Benjamin Franklin. My thought, I think, which I think might be, I don't know. I feel like it's cool that this is kind of like reflecting Benjamin Franklin and American history in this sort of way and the rattlesnake because it's like the American guesser is saying that America is like this rattlesnake. They have the rattlesnake on their album cover and it's almost like they're saying like Metallica, the self-titled record, like we are the American metal band, like the number one, like if we represent metal in America, it's Metallica, you know, that's kind of like what I'm getting, you know, I would say they're definitely the biggest metal band coming out of the U.S. for sure, so, and I don't think anybody would really deny that as far as like commercial success goes, it's Metallica, bar none, so I think that that's very interesting, and I think that they're kind of like tongue-in-cheeking it, you know, and they're like, yeah, we're the best metal band in the U.S. <laughs> commercial success. You want to see all of our Grammy Awards and nominations? We'll prove it to you. <laughs> so, now we are going to the seventh track, which is called Through the Never. <laughs> for the record because you have this sort of like I mean it wasn't a ballad don't tread on me but it was definitely a little bit like slower than this song and I feel like this is like just helping to keep the momentum going and also like a a change in the tide you know it's like here's the chapter two we continue <laughs> you know I really like the staccato of this and I like that they had very mild sort of chanting vocals in this chorus. I do wish they were a little bit higher in the mix. They're quite buried, honestly. They're very low, so I'm wondering... I hope that they bring them up a little bit and add more to them later in the song. <laughs> Alone in the family of the sun 
often that they would just like leave it off on the never. <laughs> I love the reverb on that. I love the panned vocals, how they like played around with it. They would have it start here, here, and then I think here again, here again, and then center. And they just kept doing that. I really, really like that. I feel like this one is, is very like punchy, drivey, and I really like the, the staccato stops. It's still, I think it's definitely stronger than the previous one, Don't Tread On Me, but it's like, you know, they gotta fill space, okay? Not every song, we would hope that every song is a banger, but sometimes not all of them are bangers. I still think this one's a banger. So far there haven't been any songs that I haven't like, there haven't been any songs that I don't like, for sure. I think Don't Tread On Me might be like, personally, the weakest one, either that one or Sad But True are the two that like are the weakest so far. But I definitely think The Unforgiven, oh, oh, The Unforgiven, okay? That's like my favorite one. So let's look at these lyrics real quick. Through the Never. A reflection upon the universe and how mankind has taken its place in it along with its never-ending appetite when it comes to thinking about the unknown and seeking knowledge and information. Years later, it would baptize the 2013 concept movie Metallica through the never. Ooh, they came out with a movie? Did you watch it? What do you think? Where did they record this at? In Los Angeles, one-on-one -on -one studios. I'm assuming that's their own studio, like home studio one, in reflection to one. Interesting. It would be nice to add Jason vocals. Catchy song, definitely a catchy song. Through the never. All that is, ever, ever was, will be ever, twisting, turning, through the never. In the dark, see past our eyes, pursuit of truth, no matter where it lies. Gazing up to the breeze of the heavens on a quest, meaning, reason. Come to be how it begun, all alone in the family of the sun, curiosity teasing everyone. On our home, third stone from the sun. Interesting. Yeah, we know about where the sun is and all that and yada yada. Title of a Jimi Hendrix son is borrowed to describe the celestial body which is home to the human race, Earth, the third planet orbiting the sun. Interesting. Third stone from the sun. What song did they use from Jimi Hendrix? That's interesting. Okay, let's continue. We got a lot more songs left to go. Nothing Else Matters is the eighth track and our next in this journey.
this way Life is ours, we live it our way Always words I don't just say on this track I was hoping that they would have a nice like soft ballad girl and they delivered nothing else matters tell me your thoughts down below in the comments but this is like oh, oh with the strings with the strings and his voice is so crisp in this recording too it's just like such a good a boy track, I lack it. This song is so beautiful. Let me also plug in my computer. Okay. Let 
I'm using this time for plugging my computer. This song is beautiful. I'm emotionally overwhelmed. There's acoustic guitar, there's beautiful vocals, beautiful strings, and honestly, I'm here for it. And they were building it up and gave me a good ass solo. Okay, let's continue. Forever trusting. Uh, nothing else matters. Okay. Spooner, will you stop? Oh my gosh, this song. On their controversial self-titled album, which came to be known as the Black Album, Nothing Else Matters was perhaps the greatest example of the new Metallica sound that alienated core fans. Oh. Frontman James Hetfield had been taking classical guitar lessons and wanted to show off his finger-picking skills in the introduction. I liked it. The song grew out of an extension of a phone call James made with his girlfriend while on tour and he was picking his guitar while on the phone. While the song does get heavy during the second guitar so solo, it is for the most part a ballad about expressing your feelings, like an Emerson poem. It was a song for myself in my room on tour when I was bumming out about being away from home. It's quite amazing. It's a true testament to honesty and exposing yourself, putting yourself, your real self out there and taking the risk, taking a gamble that someone's either going to step on your heart with spikes on or they're going to put their heart right next to it and you never know until you try. That solidified, I think, that we were doing the right thing, writing from the heart about what we felt, and you can't go wrong that way. Nothing Else Matters has become a song that any complete beginner who has never picked up a guitar can feel like they are playing Metallica for a few measures. Oh my goodness. So what's this part? Famed Hollywood composer Michael Kamen contributed an orchestrated part which was mixed somewhat low in the song. It is low in the song. I wish it was heavier. To compensate years later, Metallica did the SM concert and album with Cayman conducting the San Francisco Symphony with Nothing Else Matters being a centerpiece and single. Ah! We're gonna have to listen to that for sure. Ah. Uh. James Hetfield said, Nothing Else Matters was a song for me. It was not to be heard by the general public. It was a song written in hotel rooms on Justice Tour about missing friends at home, being out for such a long time. That was a song that was not meant to be played for other people. Interesting. It was for me. I think that's important, to write music that makes you feel good. I've got quite a few songs that are like that. Nothing Else Mattered was heard by the band, and they thought it was amazing. I thought, you're crazy. That's just this sappy ballad thing <laughs> that makes me feel okay. Not that's good. 
that just goes to show I have no idea what's good laughs. But it eventually made its way out there. It was a vulnerable, vulnerable song for me and a real risk at the time, being where I was at the time to let that song go and be heard. I'm really glad they all pushed for it. I think it's a vulnerable song that everyone can relate to. It doesn't really mean one thing. It's not just about relationship. I've seen that song show up for sport teams. It's a belonging, belonging song. Yeah, I think it's like, it sounds like it's a song about wanting to be, yeah, belong, like be at home, like longing even for what's familiar. So close, no matter how far, couldn't be much more from the heart, forever trusting who we are and nothing else matters. They were in the studio recording the band. Ba -ba. That is so much to read. Um, he considered it a personal song and didn't want it to appear on the album, but Ulrich convinced him otherwise. Later on, Hetfield said he forgot what the song was even about, but that was post black tour and post rehab. There is footage in two different Metallica touring documentaries showing Hetfield on the phone at the time he composed Nothing Else Matters. Sounds like he was missing, yeah, his girlfriend, missing his home, just wanting to be somewhere familiar and was away from it. All right, we have four more songs. The next one is called Of Wolf and Man. of his voice and the like vibrato that he's got he really has a nice a nice voice and he's the way that he's like carrying it in these verses is really nice to be able to hear that vibrato um and i also like the guitar riff there's little licks that they're doing it's nice so far it's kind of still meh but i like the first verse like taking the fallen lamb, like I like it, and then shape shifts the, uh, you know, something like that. I like the concept of it. Still feeling it out though. Out of the wild, fear in your eyes. It's later than you realized. Shape shift, nose through the wind. Shape shift.
that one is the only song so far that I'm like meh on. That is our first meh track for me. <laughs> I feel like there wasn't anything that really grabbed me. I did like the concept of it. Um, but I felt like they definitely have much stronger songs on this record. So, let's see, ninth track. Da, da, da. Or dubbed by fans. Black album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of Wolf and Man follows a human shape shifting into a wolf at full moon, told through the shapeshifter's perspective. This song was written by James Hutfield and composed by him, Lars, and her. Yeah, I feel like it's definitely an interesting song. I like that it's about a shape shifting wolf. Um, it's very Slayer. It feels very Slayer. Um, kind of like storytelling wise. Um, I feel like it's not super typical of them to have this type of stuff. Maybe I'm wrong. Off through the new day's mist I run. Out from the new day's mist I have come. I hunt, therefore I am. Harvest the land, taking the fallen lamb. I love this first verse. It's just like bars. Oh man, off through the new day's mist I run, out from the new day's mist I have come. We shift, pulsing with the earth, company we keep, roaming the land while you sleep. So just talking about being a wolf and shape-shifting into one. Shape-shift nose to the wind. Shape-shift, feeding I have been. I've been feeling the shape-shift. Yeah, kind of a throwaway song for me, honestly. It's not a bad thing, but it's also like, yeah, you know, I think I'll definitely be giving it some more of a listen, um, but it didn't grab me immediately. So let's go to the 10th track, which is called The God That Failed. for the lack of whatever we just listened to chorus wise, which is fine. I'm still hopeful, okay? But we're coming to the tail end of the record, so you know, this, this, it's not weird for there to be filler tracks in this sort of middle section of the record, but I will say the riff for this song is much better than Of Wolf and Man. <laughs>
that stop. You can hear him go, hey, like super far back. It must have been like either just something in the studio that they just like accidentally caught, you know, him from another like room or something and he did that. And they were like, that kind of sounds dope. Like, let's just keep it like that. I like that. Because if, if they wanted it to be there, they would have made it more forward. But I like that it's not. It's just, it's almost like it's not supposed to be there, but they just kept it in there. Uh, the solo. Let's talk about that for a second. What are your thoughts on the solo for this song? Because I feel like over this riff, ba -na -na, ba -na, like, it didn't know what it wanted to be, the solo, but it, like, worked. <laughs> it worked, and it was, like, in the pocket, but not in the pocket. It was supposed to, like, it sounds like it's not supposed to work, but it works. I don't know. I'm not mad at it. It sounds really good. <laughs> but they do something like that and then end it on just ugh, the one stroke. His voice, too, just being able to hear, like, all the little things that he's doing. Got the film. I like it. He has really good vocal control. The God that failed. Burn it Definitely a super catchy riff. I'm here for it. Oh, this song is about Jane Hatfield's mother and her refusal of cancer treatment because of her Christian science beliefs. The beliefs are that you should not be healed by doctors nor take modern medication. So when Hetfield's mother developed cancer, the only help she was given was in the form of prayer. Oof. She ultimately died. His father had already left the family a few years prior to Hetfield's mother's death, leaving him now without either parent, though father came back years later once James was already rich and famous, of course. <laughs> when I was writing that song, I was in the throes of hatred around it, an upheaval of some unpleasant childhood stuff. I know what my higher power is all about, and I know, but what my parents' idea of a higher power was all about. So I'm able to leave their stuff with them and take my stuff where I need to claim it. I'm able to move on with that and the song is pretty dang heavy. Sounds like it. Oof, sounds very painful for your mama. Is what it sounds like. What is this? I see faith in your eyes. Never you hear the discouraging lies. I hear faith in your cries. Broken is the promised betrayal, the healing hand held back by the deepened nail. Follow the God that failed. James Hetfield's parents were deeply devout Christian scientists. He could see it in how they carried themselves. No matter how much faith they had, though, it wasn't enough. God wouldn't heal Mrs. Hetfield's cancer. That is the betrayal that James is talking about, the discouraging lies seems to reference the entire outside world. There was medicine available to heal Mrs. Hetfield, but using the medicine of man contract contradicted her strong faith. She would have regarded talk of healing medicine as lies from the devil sent to discourage true believers. The healing hand held back by the deepened nail is a reference to Christ's crucifixion. 
He had nails driven through his hands. We know that James Hatfield is expressing his anguish. The healing was for long ago people, possibly apocryphal, and not for the people in his life who had faith. There's also an element of painting himself as a Christ-like figure, crucified by the false faith of his parents. Well, sometimes you just can't help people who believe in certain things, you know? If that is their wish, then that is their wish. It feeds, it feeds, it grows. It is, I can see like how it would be hard to be in that position though, of like your mom is like dying of cancer and you at least know that she could have a shot of like getting rid of it with modern medicine, but because she believes that that's like, you know, totally against her faith and not at all anything that she should be taking or whatever like what are you gonna do how can you try and convince somebody that you love that like modern medicine and stuff like that can have an opportunity to save you um definitely a hard thing to swallow and i'm sure that he was very much not going through a good time during all that goodness interesting lyrics. I do like the, the riff of that song for sure. Okay. We have two more songs. We're going to try and blaze through this because I've been filming for almost definitely I've been filming for two hours. <laughs> so all for you because I genuinely care about you and these album reactions are the bomb. But we have two more songs. The first is the 11th track, My Friend of Misery. I wish it was just a little bit higher in the mix, honestly, 
because it sounds so good. This riff, too, again, following the sort of instrumental theme of this whole record is girthy. She's mean. She's in the pocket, especially when they do halftime with this. Oh, it's so good. The chorus is falling a little flat for me, but oh, at the beginning is just so delicious. You, you'll take it on all yourself. Remember, misery loves company. Jimi Hendrix funky girl I really like that this it reminds me of Pantera again it's in the pocket she's 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 giving us she's serving she's serving us the pocket and I like it I like it 
I prefer when it's like more in this like halftime groove than like the actual dun 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 dun, dun you know. I like when it's like kind of halftimey, but that's just a personal thing. The whole thing still kind of vibes. Missouri. I miss me. Wow, big stretches. Yeah, I got one more song. I got one more. No, 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 no. My Friend of Misery is a track about an outsider's view of someone wandering in self-pity and having a very pessimistic view of the rest of the world. The song was supposed to be the album's instrumental track to follow the tradition from previous albums. Oh. However, Hatfield later, cha later changed this after favoring vocals. He details this in a June 2012 interview with The Village Voice. That song was originally an instrumental. I don't know how or why. I just started adding vocals to it and brought it to another level. That twin solo-y thing is pretty cool. Kirk and I are planning, pulling that off pretty good. Those are the solos that I'm able to contribute. Some of those non-fast solos, more melodic with crazy harmonies. That's what I like doing. It's worth noting that the song was first played live in 2012 with Metallica's European Black Album Tour where they revisited each track of the album. Very nice. Yeah, I think it's a very nice, it's kind of like, it wants to be a ballad, but it's not a ballad. Not very many notes on this song at all. I guess because it just, he just started adding vocals to it. You just stood there screaming, fearing no one was listening to you. They say the empty can rattles the most, the sound of your own voice must soothe you. Hearing only what you want to hear and knowing only what you've heard. You, you've smother, you're smothered in tragedy and you're out to save the world. Misery. You insist that the weight of the world should be on your shoulders. Misery. There's so much more to life than what, I, what you see, my friend of misery. I like that. I like the concept of it. It's interesting that it's like an instrumental. It started out as an instrumental. It was supposed to be the album's instrumental track to follow the tradition from previous albums. So then I'm assuming if that's what they're talking about, that the struggle within is going to be their instrumental final finale. So without further ado, Let's get into track number 12, the closing at track, The Struggle Within.
bring it up just enough. Struggle with that. Struggle with that. And I also like that it invites crowd interaction. Y'all know that I love songs that allow for crowd interaction. And this is cool. It's a good closer uh, or like a good, you know, halftime show interlude song. I just stuck my whole foot in Coda's yawning mouth. That was pretty dang cute. Don't worry, I'm wearing socks, okay? But that was pretty cute. She wasn't expecting it. Because, like, the eighth song through the eleventh song are all, like, well over four minutes long. And it's, like, that one just felt like it was two minutes long. Very commercial in terms of, like, uh, layout. Um, but they also... I wish they had had an instrumental track, but I guess this is... I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming this is the first album that they had that they didn't have an instrumental track. Um, but what they lack in, in the instrumental track, they gave us a delicious guitar solo <laughs> for this song. The Struggle With Them! Very much something that you could sing along to. Pretty decent closer. It's an alright closer. It's kind of a safe bet closer, you know, it's not super strong. It's kind of just like, you know, this kind of catchy, short commercial closer. I feel like they should have closed this and gone out with a bang. You know, something maybe a little bit more emotional. They could have even swapped it, swapped places My Friend of Misery with The Struggle and just had My Friend of Misery close the album or something like that. Just to give it a little bit of oomph, you know. That's just my personal opinion. What is yours? What do you think about the, uh, the closing track, The Struggle Within? Based on the melancholy lyrics, Coda, get your butt back in here. Based on the melancholy lyrics, it seems the narrator of the song has a struggle within himself that has consumed him and his mind, consisting of a feeling, probably anxiety, depression, anger, or something else. What the hell, what is it that you think you're gonna find? Hypocrite, boredom sets into the boring mind. Reaching out for something you've got to feel while clutching to what you had thought was real. Struggle within, you see your own coffin. Struggle within, the struggling within. Oh, you seal your own coffin can be compared to suicide, the fate of some of the world's people 
both renowned and unknown, the reasoning behind the feelings that cause this are a lost cause to track down, but the people with these feelings aren't with such depressing thoughts. Some could say they're doomed to die by their own hand or not. It's a wonder whether or not it's true since it's human nature. Our feelings are a wonder all on its own at times and sometimes not leading to accusations that we're on a set path, whether it's to instant death or instant success. The pace of life can change a person's views in just seconds, although time can seem to go on to go by quick for the majority of people. Others may think the opposite. One can argue that waiting for death is useless and the mental battle on whether life or death should come first occurs. The same mental battle can be fought with anything in life and whatever it may be, it can be the struggle within. Interesting. I feel like for the message, it's a good closer, um, but I feel instrumentation wise, mm, eh, good song, don't get me wrong. I do think the song is good. I think it's better than a couple. There were a few duds. There was only one like real meh song for me personally. Um, I just feel like as far as like closing albums, it's not, it's not super strong. So as far as my final thoughts go on this record, bestie, I have been filming for two and a half hours. So let's do these final thoughts, shall we? <laughs> Um, definitely I think the strong points of this album is the riffs. I, I, I don't know too much of the history of Metallica. I've heard mixed reviews about their discography. I know they have a lot of fans that think their entire discography is great. I think there's a lot of people that think after like and Justice and For All, and Justice For All, they fell off. Some people say no, they fell off after the Black Album. Um, some people say, you know, they never did. So it's always just a mixed bag. <laughs> but the Black Album, what are your thoughts on it? I feel like they're very riff heavy, very catchy. Um, I feel like I was really able to like grasp uh, James' help. Fields, uh, voice and his voice vocal control, his vibrato. I was really able to understand the meaning behind a lot of their songs, their recording process, which was really cool. I think the best songs on this album is definitely Enter Sandman. The Unforgiven was really good. Um, I think. I think Wherever I May Roam was also good. Um, or was that one of the duds? Definitely The Unforgiven and Inter Sandman were really, really good. Um, and I think Nothing, Nothing Else Matters was also one of the ballads too. That was really good. Um, there were a couple duds. I think the most duddy of them being Of Wolf and Man. I just felt like it lacked what I was really looking for. I also think Don't Tread On Me was kind of a filler track. Same with Sad But True. Um, there were elements of Sad But True that I really liked. Um, and as well as Holier Than Thou I think was like a good song too. I still stand behind the fact that The Struggle Within is just a good song but a weak album closer. I feel like I wanted something to have a little bit more oomph. Whereas like a struggle, the struggle within was very commercial and just, I wanted more of a wailing solo, but they did have a really good solo in that song particularly. Um, so really good balance of ballads and bangers. It was just bumpy. It was catchy. It was commercial, obviously. Um, and it was just really great to be able to read more on like how they recorded it and what went on. I also wish that they did have an instrumental track. I mentioned this before. Um, that, let me know more about that. 
apparently most albums have one i don't know um this one did win a grammy so it's a successful record if you count the grammys as like success <laughs> i think they're questionable at times but uh you can't deny that metallica is the most successful metal band in the u.s so what are your thoughts on uh the black album what do you think about this record what's your favorite song what's your least favorite song do you agree with me about the struggle within and it being a weak closing track but a good song overall um and what are your thoughts on a wolf and man um and do you agree with me on the duds of this album what are the duds for you any meh songs um and if the black album is not your album then what Metallica album is your favorite? That's what I want to know. So thank you so much for watching. That's going to be my video today. I hope that you are still watching. If you are still here, I really appreciate it. I know these videos are long, but also very fun um, to do. And to just hang out with y'all is honestly why I do it. So um thank you so much for being here thank you so much for spending time with me don't forget to like and comment and share the video with your fellow metallica fans we are growing so fast we just hit 12,000 subscribers i'm getting everything ready to uh get my twitch going i just wanted it to be professional looking so i had to do some upgrades okay we had to upgrade some stuff but we're also still making you know youtube revenues we're trying okay small time youtube channel okay so the twitch is coming um and i think she'll be up and running here in a few weeks um i'm getting the software all figured out and i'm getting all my equipment set up so it's just seamless professional looking and we can just jump right in and do live metal reactions, gameplay, I'm thinking we're going to play some Minecraft, maybe some Skyrim, you know, y'all, we're going to do some, uh, some metal reactions, we're going to do a lot of fun stuff, so do stay tuned, we have so much in store, um, if you haven't subscribed, do so, again, this whole channel is about my uh, experience first experience listening to metal so I'm deep diving into tons of different bands and tons of different albums so if that is of interest to you subscribe uh, discord the mosh pit link in the description PO box for metal unboxings if you want to send something also in the description that's it that's the video <laughs> so I hope that you're doing well. I hope that you are safe. I hope that you are having a good time wherever you are, whenever you're watching this. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I will see you soon. Bye. She just goes a little mad sometimes. We all go a little mad sometimes.